I am grateful for the invitation from Maxine Phillips to submit this mini talk to Religious Socialism. My name is Gary Dorian. I teach at Union Theological Seminary and Columbia University. I've been involved in democratic socialist organizing since 1974 when I joined the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, DSOC. So I am a co-founder of DSA and almost a co-founder of DSOC. In my 20s, I was a solidarity organizer and a chapter president of three left progressive organizations. At 30, I was ordained in the Episcopal Church and started writing books. At 35, I became an academic. I have 20 books out there that break into two broad categories. One side of my work is theological and philosophical, specializing in post-Kantian and post-Hegelian idealism. The other side is social ethical and political, sometimes with a religious bent and sometimes not. In the academy, these are very different disciplinary tracks, but I've never thought of it that way because my work is held together by the intertwined traditions of religious socialism and secular democratic socialism. I grew up poor, semi-rural, and nominally Catholic in mid-Michigan. I would be nowhere near the academy or the church without the witness of Martin Luther King Jr., who broke through to me before I knew much of anything about politics or religion or the world outside mid-Michigan. Currently, I am completing the third volume of a trilogy on black social Christianity. The first volume, The New Abolition, revolves around W.E.B. Du Bois and the neo-abolitionists of his generation. The second volume, Breaking White Supremacy, revolves around King and the civil rights movement. The third volume, A Darkly Radiant Vision, interprets the period from the early 1970s to the present day. When this book comes out, it will fulfill a dream I have had for a long time that somebody, even me if necessary, will write a history of the black social gospel tradition. Meanwhile, two years ago, I published a book on European socialism titled Social Democracy in the Making. And this coming September, there will be a sequel titled American Democratic Socialism, History, Politics, Religion, and Theory. I will argue that a great many Americans are losing their tolerance for extreme class disparities. European social democracy has created welfare states that extend the rights of political democracy to the social and economic realms. The government pays for everyone's health care, higher education is free, elections are publicly financed, and solidarity wage policies restrain economic inequality. In the USA, health care depends on what you can afford. Many have no health coverage at all. Students enter the workforce with crippling debt. Private money dominates the political system, and severe inequality worsens constantly. The establishments of both political parties denigrate as socialist the goals of rectifying inequality and building a green economy. But that makes socialism sound pretty good to people who have seen enough of neoliberalism. My history of U.S. American socialism has four framing arguments. One, this entire tradition has sought to Americanize democratic socialism by speaking the language of individual liberty, trying to build a coalition party of the democratic left, and grappling with U.S. American racism, cultural diversity, exceptionalist mythology, and activist religion. Two, religious socialism has been much more important in the U.S. American socialist tradition than scholarship about it conveys. Nearly all the African Americans and women who joined the socialist movement in the early 20th century came through the door of Christian socialism. Three, 
The best traditions of socialism are like the original socialist movement in being predominantly cooperative and decentralized. Nationalization is only one form of socialization, and usually not the best one, though sometimes it is the best one. The best U.S. American traditions of democratic socialism have emphasized bottom-up economic democracy instead of centralized government interventions from above. Four, the convention that democratic socialism is too idealistic to be even worth talking about must be challenged. There had damned well better be an alternative to neoliberalism and destroying the planet. I trace the early socialist currents of the 19th century, dwelling on the first great hope of radical industrial unionism, the Knights of Labor, a Christian socialist industrial union, and the early socialist party, a wondrous stew of radical Democrats, neo-abolitionists, Marxists, social gospel Christians, populists, feminists, trade unionists, industrial unionists, single taxers, social democrats, anarcho-syndicalists, Fabians. The early Socialist Party was remarkably successful at politics, despite its labor problem, and it had little trouble speaking American, despite its Marxian caste. The craft unionism of the American Federation of Labor fatally truncated the labor movement and the kind of socialism that was possible in this country thwarting socialists from scaling up and from creating a labor party. Socialists bravely opposed World War I and were viciously persecuted for doing so. Then they were devastated by the meteor of world communism. Afterward, they tried to build a farmer labor socialist progressive party, but were defeated by obstacles new and old. The heyday of Eugene Debs ended in shattered despair, yielding the dismal run-up to Norman Thomas socialism, as it was called. It was a three-sided struggle to renew the democratic socialist idea, hold off the Communist Party, and get a farmer labor socialist progressive party off the ground. Norman Thomas was eloquent, personable, astute, courageous, and not cut out to be a party leader. Martin Luther King called him the most courageous person he ever met. Thomas symbolized the shift of the Socialist Party from being primarily working class to being primarily a vehicle of middle class idealism, faithfully on both sides. Norman Thomas' socialism had just played out when I entered this movement. The exotic turbulence and destruction of the 1960s had just passed. People only a few years older than me felt much older to me for having lived through the rise and fall of SNCC and SDS. Many of us who entered college in the early 1970s were eager for the 70s to begin. That never happened. We had a glimpse from our youth of what a mass movement looks like. It was a million people descending on DC to protest the war. But we had only fragments of movements. These fragments went on to devise thicker conceptions of justice, privileging race, gender, and sexuality as categories of analysis and sites of oppression. I was a witness to the generational turn in which the left thrived in only one place, a new place for us, the academy. I held out from it, working in DSA and the Latin American solidarity movements. But eventually I joined the academic train, waiting for the opening that now has come with Occupy and Black Lives Matter and the Bernie campaigns. When I came in, the Democratic left was just beginning to discover Gramsci and just beginning to theorize market socialism, both of which remain substantial enterprises today. 
Antonio Gramsci argued that capitalism exercises hege hegemony over the lives of people, where they live, in schools, civic organizations, religious communities, newspapers, media, political parties. Hegemony is the cultural process by which a ruling class makes its domination appear natural. If the left has any serious intention of winning power, it must contest the right on the cultural level. That's what Gramsci said in the 1920s, and it's every bit as true today. Market socialism, or better, economic democracy, is the idea that there must be a way to combine socialist planning and cooperation with capitalist markets. Much of my work has dealt with the mechanisms, lim limits, and trade-offs of economic democracy, especially producer cooperatives. Economic democracy on a national scale is way out there beyond our horizon. But on a smaller scale, it's the everyday struggle to build the cooperative sector, expand it, and extend the values of democracy. It builds institutions that don't belong wholly to the capitalist market or the state. Producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, community land trusts, worker co-determination, community finance corporations. In the USA, we decimated our manufacturing base by exporting jobs with a frenzy that made a few people rich and caused colossal devastation. In Germany, they didn't wipe out their manufacturing base because Germany has 50% worker co-determination on every company supervisory board. Workers don't export their own jobs. Yardstick public corporations are another model of economic democracy. A publicly owned bank or pharmaceutical company or health insurer can measure what the market actually requires in industries that tend to become oligopolies. Like many of you, I have been involved in this work for a long time and much of it was very lonely. Whatever else might be said about our situation today, it isn't lonely. A great rebellion is underway against severe inequality and destroying the planet. And we have never seen anywhere near this many white people willing to demonstrate against white supremacy and an utter backlash of white nationalism. For better and for worse, we are in a moment when profound new departures are possible. I greatly prefer the opportunities for justice that exist today over the reign of Tina. There is no alternative that blighted two entire generations. Hang in there, friends, and thanks for inviting me.